All right, Psalm 92, let's dig right in here. Now, the Bible says this, too, and, and I, I bring this up occasionally on the title. Sometimes I go over the title for this psalm. We'll cover this at the end after we go through verse by verse. But um, the Bible says here that this is a psalm or song for the Sabbath day. So um, we're going to go through what all the verses mean, and then I'm going to give my opinion on why I think that's applicable here, why it's, why it's referencing this as being a song for the Sabbath day. Um, it makes sense to me, but let's, let's go through this and, and we'll kind of leave that for last. So uh, verse number one reads, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. And I just want to point out here, as we've seen in other psalms as well, at this point, we've gone through 92 psalms overall, just in general in this church. Uh, we went through Psalm 1 through 50 previously, and now we're going through 51 through 100. And in Psalm 92, it references here, you know, hey, it's good. It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It's a good thing to sing praises. And oftentimes, those two things go hand in hand, right? Praises are giving thanks to the Lord uh, in, in many, in many uh, applications. But we ought to be giving thanks. We ought to be singing praises and not just at church, right? Like it says here, showing forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. So we, we should be singing. We should be thankful, giving thanks unto the Lord, uh, praising his name every morning and every night. And why? Because of his loving kindness. Why? Because of God's faithfulness. Why? Because God is there for us, because God is who we look to. But then, not just the singing and the praising there and the giving thanks. Verse number three, because this, this, this sentence isn't complete yet. Verse three says, upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp, with a solemn sound. So not only singing, but also the addition of the, the musical instruments accompanying that praise in that singing and that also being done on a regular basis, on a, on a daily basis even, um, playing to the Lord and, and singing his praises. And this is something that um, many of us might not be doing that good at. I mean, hopefully you are in your prayers thanking the Lord every day and being very contrite and thankful in your heart for all that God gives you to have that maintain that humble spirit but also just praising him, right? Don't forget to praise, to praise the Lord and, and not, not as a checkbox like, well, I have to do this, right? The, the praises ought to come from your heart and they will come from your heart. I mean, those of us who are saved, there's every reason to praise the Lord, but you won't, you won't even think to praise the Lord Unless you're thinking about the things of God, unless you're thinking about, you know, what God has done for you, you're in his word and, and you're establishing and maintaining that good relationship by doing spiritual things. And this is why I said in the announcements, when I, look, when I talk about our February challenge, spending an hour every day of doing something spiritual, I don't think that ought to be a challenge for you. I think that ought to be a minimum for you. I think this is something that we ought to be spending that much time just spiritually with the Lord. And if you are spending that much time spiritually with the Lord, it's going it's to be a lot more natural from the Spirit to want to praise His name, to be, to, to be giving thanks and to, and to doing what the Bible's talking about here, about giving thanks, singing praises in the morning and every evening. This is, this is where... Um, where that's going to come from. It doesn't just happen, though, on its own. You have to put in the time, you have to put in the effort to maintain that good relationship with God because it's, there's always, always distractions every day to take you away from the things of God. And of course, there are necessities in life, no doubt. We have to live, we have to work, we have to survive, we have to do other things to, to live this life. But we cannot neglect the importance of maintaining that good relationship with the Lord. That is, that is critical. And that's how we'll find ourselves um, showing forth his loving kindness and his faithfulness every night. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four. 
For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. And I want you to notice three times here, twice in this one verse four, and then also in verse number five, O Lord, how great are thy works. Right? The, the, the praising of God's works and what God has done and what God is empowering you to do. And, uh, you know, the work of the Lord is what is praiseworthy. There is no um, triumphing in the works of my hands here. It's triumphing in the works of thy hands. It's the glory and the praise and the rejoicing over what God does. And this doesn't mean that we're not involved in that. It's recognizing that the, the goodness and the praise belongs and is deserved to go to the Lord. I mean, you think about every battle that God had led the children of Israel in. Uh, in the Old Testament, you read through the Judges, you read through the Kings and the Chronicles, and you read about these different stories where they were getting in these battles. And, and when they were right with God and when they would consult the Lord and God is going to bring them victory, then... God is always the one that gets the credit for it, but they still have to show up. They're still, they're still going to go, they're still going to fight in many cases, right? Sometimes God didn't even make them have to fight, but every time they have to show up. We were just reading, I was doing my family Bible reading, and we just read a passage to my kids where God already promised Jehoshaphat, he's like, you know what, I'm going to do all the work. And that was when they had three different groups of people that came against them. And then they ended up fighting themselves. And they just all attacked each other. And then they showed up and then it's like all dead corpses. And they're like, sweet. So they just go out and they spoil the bodies and get all the stuff that they could get. And God just brought that, that miracle all by himself. But they still showed up. He still said, go and be prepared and be ready and, and stand out there. I mean, he couldn't just run away and be scared and, and quit. Right? They still had to show up. And, and at every point, though, no matter how much of our own effort is put into the work, we're going to praise God for his works and for what he does and for bringing us those victories and the triumph in the work of God's hands. Oh, Lord, how great are thy works and thy thoughts are very deep. Verse 6, a brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. And it, that's, that in itself is just kind of interesting to me because it's like, it's such a simple concept and it's, and it's so easy to see. And for those of us who are saved and have been through struggles and you've relied on God to help you and to save you and he's, and he's delivered you, like this is so easy to see and so basic and so elementary, but you know, the brutish man and the fool, they don't, under, they don't get this. You know, people lean on their own understanding too much, just, just don't get this at all. Look at verse number seven. The Bible says, when the, when the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. First of all, because it brings up workers of iniquity, I think, twice in this passage, and when we see later, as we get into Psalm 92, a little bit farther, um, it, it refers to seeing, um, uh, what's the word? See, seeing my, um, my desire on mine enemies, right? So that's, that's going to imply, uh, you know, wanting to see them being judged and being destroyed. And... The reason why this isn't contradictory to where the Bible teaches to love your enemies is you got to understand who the workers of iniquity are when, in, in reference to Scripture and when we look at other Scripture. Because in general, yeah, you know, we, we're not wishing evil on people. We should be out there, you know, loving our enemies, lo you know, loving our brethren and, and doing good. But there is a small group of people that are the enemies of the Lord that we should not be blessing, that we should not be encouraging, and that we, should some, you know, we shouldn't even be praying for. And when the Bible is referring to this, and I've done Bible studies on this in the past, and I just want to give some examples for you. And I'm going to go through a lot of these really quick. 
Um, but you can write them down if you want to look up these references later and do the, do the study on your own later on too if you, if you want to fact check this and, and check it out for yourself. When, when the Bible is referring to this workers of iniquity, it's kind of like a, a class or a group of people. You can say, yeah, but we're all workers of iniquity because we're all, we're all sinners, right? But that's not how the Bible uses this phrase. It's just not. And, and I'll show you from Scripture that this is, a, this is a phrase that's used for people who are not just your average sinner. Now, Psalm 5.5 5 says this, The foolish shall, shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. So it says that God hates all the workers of iniquity. Psalm 6, 8 says, Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. And this is the psalmist saying, Hey, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, because God's heard the voice of my weeping. Psalm 14, 4 says, Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord. So these are clearly people that are not calling upon the Lord, they, they, they have no knowledge, and they're eating up God's people like they would eat bread. I mean, this is a wicked people that's just destroying God's people, just like it's no big deal, just as they'd eat bread. Continuing on with these other references, Psalm 28.3 says, Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. And, you know, I, I brought this up before, too. I think we all can know when well, we've all been unsaved before and I could speak for myself. I never had this heart where I would plot and plan someone else's demise and mischief against people like just, or I'm going to do this and I'm going to lie in wait and I'm going to do all these things like these evil things to, to, to just have it out for someone and set traps for people. Right? Like that's a special, that's a, that's a different type of person who does those things. I'm not saying every person who's ever set a trap for someone <coughs> is some reprobate. But rather, this is a characteristic of the workers of iniquity that they do these things. Like that this is in their heart. This is what they're about. That they, um, they're, they're the ones that have mischief in their heart, but they'll speak peace, right? So they'll, they'll lie to you and say, oh yeah, hey brother, you know, on, on the outward, they're the, they're the wolf in sheep's clothing. They're the ones that are going to make themselves look good to other people, but then they're really um, wolves that are looking to destroy. Uh, Psalm 53 verse 4 says, Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. And there's another, uh, you say, well, didn't we just read that? No, that was in Psalm 14 that sounded very familiar to, to this, almost identical to Psalm 53, 4. Psalm 59, 2 says, Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. Psalm 64, 2 says, Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity. And then even in Luke chapter 13, there's a New Testament reference to this. Luke 13, verse 27 the Bible says, but he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. So clearly these are people who are damned to hell um, where he's calling them the workers of iniquity and saying, depart from me and referring to the, the gnashing of teeth that's going to be in that outer darkness. So let's go back to, um, actually turn if you would to Psalm 73. Keep your place in Psalm 92. I just wanted to throw out those references for the workers of iniquity. And I think if you study this out, you'll see the same thing that I'm talking about here that... Um, it's kind of like a group of people that I, that I would call reprobates. That these are the people that have pushed things too far, that have, that have um, hardened their heart to the point to where God has hardened their heart. And, um, and it's been darkened and they have been given over to the reprobate mind. 
But what did we see in Psalm 92 about these people? It says, um, when the wicked spring is the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, what does flourish mean? It means they're doing well, right? So when these really evil, wicked people are just doing good, they're doing well. You look at them and be like, it seems like they don't have any problems. Why, why does it look like they're being blessed? Why do these people look like everything is going well for them when I know that they're super wicked, when I know that their heart isn't right, that they're, they're setting traps for people, they're evil people? Well, it says, when they spring as a grass, when they flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. It says, basically, don't worry because it's already established that they're just going to be destroyed forever. So, yeah, right now, they seem like they're flourishing and everything's going great, but they have an end. And they have an end that you need to understand is not good. It's a destructive end. And they're going to get what's coming to them. So in, in the short term, in the temporary, yeah, everything seems to be going their way. But that's not how it's going to end for them. Psalm 73, we just covered this, um, well, a while ago now, I guess, but 20 chapters ago almost. So 20 weeks ago, roughly, we looked at this passage in, in, in its fullness. Uh, but look at verse number 3. The Bible says this, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And this goes more in depth into just having this wrong mindset when you see wicked people doing really well and he's going, look, I was envious at them. I'm looking at the wicked and their life and what they have and I'm becoming envious over these foolish people and I see their prosperity, I see how well everything's going. It's like, man, I want my life to be like that. I want to have that stuff. But that's always because you don't see the full picture anyways. Even outside of the world to come, even in this life, like you're still not seeing the full picture. Sin is always a big smoke and mirror show because people are never satisfied. Even the people with the most amount of money that seem like they have the best lives, they're never satisfied. Never satisfied. That, that's a, that, that is a, a peace they don't have. But I'm going to continue here in Psalm 73. He says, uh, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. You're just kind of going through all these things that it just seems like everything's going so well for them. They seem to have it all together. They don't really have any problems in their death. They've got their strength. They don't have trouble like other people, like normal people have problems. They, everything seems to be just fine. Jump down to verse number 16. The Bible reads, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. And of course, Psalm 73 goes into much more detail compared to Psalm 92. Psalm 92 jumps right to the end right away and says, hey, when they flourish, when they spring up, they've got an end. Amen. Don't worry about it. And Psalm 73 goes more in detail, but it's, it, it comes to the same conclusion. He says, oh, wait, yeah. Then I went into the sanctuary of God and I realized how foolish I was for being envious at the wicked people because now I understand their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. So when they're, they're so, you know, established here in this life and everything seems to be going so well, they're going to be consumed with terrors when they breathe their last breath and go to hell. That is a terrible, a terrifying sight and uh, a place to be. Go back, if you would, can, further to, uh, to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. We get a little bit more teaching on this because we don't want to have the wrong view of the, the, the well-off in this world or the rich, wicked people in this world. And I'm not saying every single person who has wealth is wicked. I don't believe that to be true, but the vast majority of them are. But, and, and obviously we have to define, well, how much wealth are you talking about here? Well, you know, I'm, I mean, on one hand, everybody in the United States is wealthy. And we ought, we ought to have that outlook and that mindset, knowing that right out, just, just, hey, we're here in this country, we're wealthy because we could do a comparison amongst humanity over a long period of time and just know that we've got it well. We've got it very well. 
But then on top of that, of course, there's just extremely, extremely grossly wealthy people that are, that are alive in these, uh, you know, th these days. And um, we ought, but we ought not to envy that and not be covetous over their stuff and the things and, and their lives and whatever else because the, it's, it's not all it's cracked up to be. So we're going to look at some of these passages and just to remind ourselves, hey, look, and, you know, when you know someone to be evil and wicked, don't be envious of them at all. There's no reason to be envious of the evildoer. Verse uh, 1, Psalm 37 says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. And again, it's referring to workers of iniquity in Psalm 37. It says, For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Jump down to verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. So he's saying, don't fret, don't worry, don't be troubled over these people and over these things that you see. It's not worth your time. Don't get anxious about it. Don't worry yourself. We have no reason to worry ourselves over the wicked and the person who's prospering in his way. Don't let it bother you. Cease from anger, verse number eight, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Why? Why can we just have peace and just take comfort and just be like, you know what? I'm not even going to worry about this at all. I'm not going to let it bother me. Why? Verse 9. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. There's two reasons, right? One is because those evildoers, look, God's going to take care of them. They're going to be cut off. They're going to see their end. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be terrifying for them. But not just that. Hey, those that wait upon the Lord, you're going to inherit the earth. So, so it seems like they have everything right now in this very short space and short amount of time. This is their heaven on earth. This is what they get. That's the, the wicked, the workers of iniquity, this is all they have is what's in this world. And it doesn't last very long, and then it's an eternity in hell. Whereas those that wait on the Lord, we may have to struggle a little bit more. We might not have all the, all the riches and things of this world, so what? We're just going to be patient. Why? Because in the end, we're inheriting the earth. Verse 10, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, they, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. Yet a little while. It's just a little amount of time, and then it's like, wait, where did that guy even live? Yeah, it's, it's not even there. It's gone. All the stuff, everything he had, gone. It's like Nothing. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Let's go back to Psalm 92. And all of these other references, these other Psalms that we turn to, it's a very similar progression through Psalm 92 as well. We talk about the, the wicked, but then it talks about the, um, the inheritance of the earth and, and God blessing those that wait on him and serve him. Um, it's that same pattern, the same truth, the same truth being expressed. Right? So we ought to take comfort, and God wants us to take comfort, which is why this is found in Scripture in multiple places, because let's face it, reality can be hard sometimes when you just day in, day out, and you get confronted with wicked people, and, and you know, there's a lot of wicked people in power and have a lot of influence and have a lot of wealth, and, and they don't make it easy for us sometimes. Right? And, it's, you know, and, and we can fret ourselves and get, and get real angry, and I'm not saying you can't have righteous anger, but at the same time, just, just understand, be like, look, they got an end. Like, we shouldn't be in despair over it. And we shouldn't be envious. And just say, okay, well, it's going to, everything will, will, will be brought before judgment. Everything will be brought before judgment. There is a judgment day. It's coming. And there's the, the resurrection of the just and of the unjust. And everyone is going to stand before God. And every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Let's keep reading here in Psalm 92. Look at verse number 8. The Bible reads, But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. 
For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. And this is where we're seeing the, the tying in of God's enemies and the workers of iniquity being the same group of people. This is talking about that group. It's God's enemies. And what I brought up earlier about having that, that mindset or that attitude towards God's enemies is different uh, than it would be on our own enemies. Verse 10 says, But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eye also shall see my desire on mine enemies. And mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. Because this is when God rights the wrongs. And all the people who have been uh, being persecuted and martyred and, and, and all of the bad things happening, you know what? Those wicked people and those workers of iniquity are going to get their end. They're going to get their due and it will be, uh, you know, for, for all the saved on earth. And you've got to understand this. There's going to be rejoicing at God's judgment. His judgment is righteous. And, and we ought to be uh, happy about God bringing in justice into the world and just righting all the wrongs. Because that is a good thing. God is a God of justice, and it's a very good trait and attribute and something that we should be looking forward to one day. Obviously, we want to see as many people get saved as possible, but you know what? The workers of iniquity are out there just, just um, the enemies of God and trying to stop people from getting saved and trying to stop all the good works from being done and, and doing um, everything they can for darkness and for wickedness, you know, they're going to get their day. And, and that's, that's just a fact. So earlier, we saw the flourishing of the wicked. Remember that? We are talking about how, how well they flourish. But now, we, we kick over, kick gears into where the flourishing is of the righteous. Verse number 12 says, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Three times now. For the one time that the wicked flourishes, there's three times that the righteous are flourishing in this passage. And that just shows how much far and above God is going to make us to flourish uh, in the end. And also notice too, verse 13, I preached on this the past week or two being planted in the house of the Lord. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of, the Lord, of our God. Right? You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do what God's going to bless that, and you're going to be really flourishing and doing really well. And I love verse 14. It says, They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. Old age. And, and would to God we could have more men and women of God in their old age continuing to serve to the best of their ability. And it's sad because we have churches that are dying out and churches that have done great works for the Lord in the past and have members that were part of all of that work and part of all of that effort in the past saved brothers and sisters, but now they've kind of stopped doing all the work and their church is about to die. But they're not dead yet. And if we could, if you know, Planting yourself in the house of the Lord, man, you need to be flourishing. But it's not enough just to plant your rear end in the house of the Lord. You got to be there, body, mind, soul, spirit, ready to serve and planted and rooted in, in the house of God, right? In, 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 in his tabernacle, in his holy hill, being with him to do the work. And I get it. As you get older, your body isn't quite as capable of doing the things that it was when it was younger. But there's still opportunities. Still opportunities that can't be wasted. And, and you know, as you get more time in general, if you get more time, I say that, you know, not necessarily everyone that goes into older age always has more time. Many do. Many still have to work until the, until the day they die. But many people get uh, more time off and are able to have more time on their hands. Look, make the most use 
out of that time so you could still be bringing forth fruit even in old age. Bringing forth fruit, bringing converts, talking to people about Christ. The job isn't finished until you breathe your last breath. Make every last use of your time, the, 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 make the best use of your time as you can. Still bring, I, I pray to God that I can still be bringing forth fruit all the way through old age and just until whatever that last day is, I breathe my last breath, I want to be a soul winner. I want to not let that ever die out and I never want to retire from serving the Lord and just say, well, I'm done now. And that's what happens when, you know, when people retire from serving God and we find the condition of many churches, like I said, they're just going to die now. The church is just, is just literally going to die because everyone's retired. Well, what's next after retirement? Death. That's it. No, keep working. I want to be fat and flourishing. <laughs> That's what the verse says, verse 14. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Right? I want to be flourishing and, you know, not physically fat, but, you know, spiritually fat. To show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. So this is a, it's a great ending to this psalm. Now, quickly, I want to cover, let's say, well, Bez of Rosens, why, would, why is this a song for the Sabbath day? It doesn't mention the Sabbath. It doesn't talk about creation. It, you know, it doesn't talk about this stuff. Why? How is that applicable? How, how would that be a proper title for this psalm? Well, because of the focus on that judgment. So it's, it's you know, I, I spent a lot more time going into more detail on some of these, these topics. But when you go back and just look at the psalm as a whole, you know, we see the giving of thanks, of course, and in praising the Lord. Why do we praise him? Because he's good, because of his faithfulness. It brings up the brutish man and the wicked and saying, you know what, they're going to, they flourish, but then it's just gone forever because God brings that judgment and then all the goodness that comes, and that's the most of this psalm is focused on how God is going to be good to the, to the righteous. And this is, these are all references to later times. This is not happening like right now in our life. This is the rest that we're going to enter into. And this is why I think this is appropriate for to being a song of the Sabbath. Because while we may suffer in this life, we enter into the rest of Jesus Christ. So um, you could turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 4. And while you're turning there, I'll just read for you from Genesis chapter 1, of course, where the first Sabbath was instituted. Genesis 1, 31, the Bible reads, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. That's the last verse of Genesis 1 that closes out that six-day creation time. And everything he did was good. And he's like, all right, it's done. And then he rests. And Genesis 2, 2 says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And you remember all the references to praising God for his works, right? Three times we saw that in this psalm. It's his works, and we're going to triumph in his works. Because that's what salvation is, is trusting in his works, not ours. It's what God has done. And he gets the credit, and he gets the glory, and he gets the honor, and he gets the praise. He gets the singing. But the seventh day God rested from the works that he had made and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that, that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And of course the Sabbath was a big deal throughout the Old Testament, a huge deal, right? In fact, it's such a big deal that if someone broke that, uh, the Mosaic law, the, the Ten Commandments of, of breaking the Sabbath, that you would be put to death. Like that was a, a, a big deal. God was clearly trying to to bring home a, a serious truth. And that truth is fully explained in the book of Hebrews. And we're going to look at one small section in Hebrews chapter 4. 
Verse number eight, the Bible says, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. There is a rest still to come. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And I'm not going to spend the, whole, the rest of the evening going through all of Hebrews 4. That's a whole Bible study in and of itself. You could read that more fully in context, Hebrews 3, Hebrews 4, and even Hebrews 5. But um, the fact is that, that God did all the work for us. And we need to recognize that and not think that, you know, we deserve uh, heaven. We deserve all the great things that God has planned for us. We don't deserve it. But we thank God because he's giving it to us and he loves us anyways. He wants us to have it. And he did all the work for us and he prepared a place for us. We don't have to go and prepare a place. He prepared a place for us. It's bought and paid for. It's, it's ready to go. And when we receive Christ, when we put our trust in him, we receive eternal life. We receive the inheritance. We receive the blessing. We receive all the goodness of God. And it has nothing to do with our own works because he did all the work for it. And we just rest in that. Just as the Sabbath day, everyone had to rest from labors. Don't do any work. Don't even, you know, the, the food preparation, all that stuff is all done prior to that. You just, you rest. You don't, I don't want you doing anything. That's what God said. I just want you resting. Why? Because it's, 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 it's a reflection of that's the only way you could be saved. You can't be thinking that you have to add anything to that. And that's why it was such a serious punishment of the death penalty. Because if you think that you can do anything, any type, add any of your type of work on top of what God's done, eh, no, it doesn't work. It's a picture of salvation. So anyone who tries to add works into salvation, not saved. Not saved. You think, you think that anything that you do, any little, like, whether it's a little bit or a lot of work, he says, none of it. You're doing none of it. None on the Sabbath day and none to enter into the rest of Christ. And that's good news for us. But I like how Hebrews 4.11 says, well, let us labor to enter into that rest. Because while we, while we have the salvation right now, we're still laboring to fully enter in to what God has prepared for us, right? We're secured, we're sealed with that salvation. But we don't just stop now and say, all right, I'm done. We say, all right, I'm done trying to work my way into heaven and trying to be good enough for heaven. Yeah, we, we stop that. But now that we know we're saved, hey, well, we're going to keep laboring until I do finally enter into his rest completely and, and go into the land that he's promised and inherit the earth and inherit the blessings that is promised to us, that is promised to those who have received the gift by faith. So, these topics were brought up in Psalm 92. Maybe not in the most obvious ways, but when you think about it, I think it makes a lot of sense as to why you can apply this and be like, you know, this is a, this is a good psalm of the, of the Sabbath. This is a song for the Sabbath because it's a psalm of rejoicing of the things to come and the, the celebration in God's works and what he had done. And hey, we're resting from ours and trusting in his. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for such a great, encouraging, edifying psalm here in Psalm 92. Uh, we thank you for doing all the work for us. And Lord, we pray that you would please work through us and help us to do great works uh, for the name of Christ, that you can get all the glory and honor and that we can show people and tell people about the, the work that you've done and the love that you have. And, and what you have in store for us, dear Lord, I pray that you would have mighty works be done through our church, through the people here that are going to show up willing to do the work, willing to face the battle, willing to um, put themselves out there and, and face the, the heat, dear Lord, uh, just to serve you and, and to do what's right. And I pray that you please help us and, and strengthen us, dear Lord, to do the right thing, to, to be preachers of your word and, and to teach the truth. 
in the midst of a, of a crooked and perverse nation, dear Lord. Help us to shine like lights. Uh, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.